Boss Empire, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of the OMU podcast. With me, Nato Makhele, matriculated in 2005 at Muir College. The person that I will be talking to is also a person that played rugby. Okay? I'll let you guys put in your guesses right now who I'm talking to, but while you're still guessing, I'll be reading you uh, some of the accolades that he's had. So, the gentleman I'm talking to today, he studied law at uh, UPE, uh, which changed to NRMU. Um, he played rugby for uh, Eastern Province under 21 and the uh, EPB side. Um, he played rugby in Australia for Brisbane. He played EPB while he was watching the Sharks game. This is actually a story I want him to tell, so I won't dive uh, more into that because I want him to tell the story. Um, he played first team for UPE and our big rival, Dispatch. Um, he got his law degree in 1999, and from 2000 and onwards, he has been living in the USA. He got married, and he has a son, and he has three stepchildren, um, two daughters, and a son. And when he was in the US, um, he paid, what is RFU? I think it's Rugby Football Union, if I'm not mistaken, but for a provincial team. And then after, he hung his boots, so he went into retirement. He looks a bit young for going into retirement, if you ask me. But uh, after he hung his boots, he went into, um, I think it was coaching in 2018. And um, we will be diving into family life and everything of that sort right here on the podcast. I don't want to give too much away before we meet the man himself. And I'm talking about Mr. Jason Zemka. How are you, sir? Fantastic, Athena. Thanks for having me. That's a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure. So, how is the weather out there? I know it's winter right now, um, yeah. up in the north. Yeah, it's not too bad in Charlotte. Um, probably about 15 or 16 degrees, which is pretty nice for winter, right? Yeah. Um, we have a couple of cold spells here and there, uh, but every now and then we get a warm day. I'm getting used to it 24 years later. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, um, I think we want to begin this journey that we're going to be going through. I want to know, uh, where were you born, where were you raised, um, and stuff like that. Yeah, where, okay, so born in Utah in 1976 uh, at the good old provincial hospital. Um, I wanted to say downtown uh, Utah, but it really isn't downtown <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the suburbs, I think, right? So, uh, but lived there, went to College Hill. Um, mm -hmm. started school there, went over to Muir Primary when it was called the Red Brick Building, um, and then moved up to the campus where we are today. Uh, and I matriculated in 1994. Um, but yeah, what a great, I mean, I almost know every single street in Newton. We used yeah. to ride those streets pretty well with those bikes of ours. <laughs> so you've recently, or not recently, um, I mean, 2000 is a long time ago, it was 24 years ago, um, you moved to America. So I want to know, what's the best part of living in America? Um, I think it's the American dream, right? Like if you if you really put your mind to it, uh, anything is achievable. It's, it's yeah. pretty amazing. I tell you what, it's pretty hard to emigrate here, I won't lie. They're pretty strict about folks coming in. But once you, uh, I think a lot of South Africans that are here, a lot of foreign guys and Americans, of course, as well, really do well you know, when they put their, put their mind to it. So, I think that's number one. Number two, the ease of everything. Um, you know, just something as simple as getting your passport can take a few weeks, which is pretty great timing wise, but, uh, everything's accessible. Um, the country is humongous. I mean, it's, it's such a big country. You don't have to go far to experience a diff, a totally different environment to what you're living in. You can drive, um, two hours over the border to another state and it's just totally different to what you're, the state you're living in. So I think that's pretty incredible. And the people are fantastic. Uh, Americans are a, a very prideful bunch. I think when I was living in South Africa, I thought they were loud. And then <laughs> I moved to America and I realized, well, that's just pride. That's just yeah, the American yeah, yeah. way. You yeah. Know? Um, but yeah, but it's been a great straight 24 years. So I want to just oppose that question to comparing it. Not, I don't even want to compare it, but how is it different from growing up and living in Mutney? Because, I mean, Mutney is a pretty small town. You know, I mean, everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's yeah. business. <laughs> in Utne. So how different is it living overseas and, and, and Utne? Uh, it's incredibly different. I, I, every now, I think when I first moved here, and, and in Charlotte's a big city, it's about a million to two million people in the entire metropole. So it's a, yeah. it's a large, vast yeah, city and it expands. But I remember going out, I mean, Utne, you knew everybody. That's the perfect topic because, yeah, you would go 
you would never bump into a familiar face, let alone yes. a person you know. You right. You can go out when I was obviously a bit younger before married life would go out to some uh, bars or restaurants and you'd never ever see a person that you've seen you know, the week before or a couple of weeks before where in PE where I went to university or you'd, <laughs> you'd go to the grocery store and see people you know all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's, I mean, you'd know, compared to Charlotte, uh, it's impossible to, to describe the size and everything takes forever to get to yes. uh, just getting into the airport can take you an hour you know and you live in the same city as the airport mm -hmm. just depending on yeah the traffic i don't uh i would i do miss short i use next traffic i'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> okay cool um so after you left school um obviously you did your law degree and you're now um at a bank uh, wells fargo one of the biggest banks in america and yeah. when i was reading through your profile um I saw something that made me think like maybe the older guys um, of your generation might not know what um, AI uh, uh, governance and, 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 and all of that. Um, what exactly do you do at Wells Fargo? Yeah, sure, sure. So I've been in banking about 18 years now. I okay. uh, started the Bank, Bank of America, moved over to Wells Fargo. But AI is artificial intelligence. And I suppose everybody in South Africa and around the world knows that there's been this increase in, in artificial intelligence and how we use it, right? And where I'm involved is how they build models and artificial intelligence models. And it can be something as simplistic as uh, an AI artificial type model that, you know, a bank the size of Wells Fargo receives millions of different emails, right? Mm. Um, and it could be as simple as sorting the different emails and putting them into specific files to a model that determines based on the usage of your... Um, financial usage of your credit card or your bank accounts, what type of new card offers we should send you. Oh, so okay. It can be very, very simple, a sorting tool to a tool that we can use to uh, target different folks for different products. And there's many more uh, uses of, of uh, artificial intelligence. Now, I don't build the AI um, because I know when I speak to people and they ask me, what's this AI thing? They get very nervous and they think about the movies where AI takes over. <laughs> I'm actually in in the good place where I'm in charge of the risk associated with these models. So we, yes. my team that I, I oversee, we look at what type of risks are we introducing to the public, right, to mm -hmm. our customers, and make sure that we don't um, include those risks in these new products. And at the same time, all the legalese around um, using that product, right? Mm -hmm. going to get is there a, law, a lawsuit if we put it out there. So that's my background. That's what I do on a daily basis. We. We don't build the models, but we make sure that we tick and tie how they use and make sure they use properly. Cool. Now let's go back to the fun part. School. Yeah. <laughs> Can you please share um, a memory that yeah. is mm -hmm. in your head that you remember from your time at Mio College? Wow. I tell you, to this day, Mio College was absolutely my favorite part uh, so far in my life. I mean, I, yeah, my wife, don't tell my wife, don't tell my kids. But <laughs> Mia, what a fantastic experience from every single teacher to the friends that I still have, right? Um, so obviously all the other stuff, but a funny <clears throat> a funny thing, and we got into serious trouble about um, we were setting up field day or, you know, uh, athletics day athletics for day. the school. And we were helping Mr. Watson, who was the uh, – the PT teacher at that yeah. stage, right? And we had those big, um, you know, those big, uh, uh, I don't know, cushions or whatever they are that the long, the high jump guys jump on. Oh, yes, right? yes, 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 yeah, yes. So, but, they were, but they're massive, right? Yeah. So some of us got this great idea that we would ride the thing down. On the banks. Um, yeah, from the bank. I mean, this is a massive thing. And I think it's about four or five of us, right? And our <laughs> entire class is out there um, setting up the PT day, right? So, so, <clears throat> There's about four or five of us who get onto this thing. I mean, it's a fantastic. I mean, think about it. And, and kids don't get this idea because now they're going, geez, that is a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, and you know, the, everybody knows the bank and it's a long bank. But anyway, yeah. mate, as we are hitting the middle of that bank and we are picking up steam, one of our guys isn't looking and he walks in front of us. Oh, right. Man. At, at, the at the bottom of the bank. And I won't mention his name because he's a good friend and, uh, I don't want to embarrass the guy, but let's just say he got rugby tackled by this massive cushion and five Ooh. rugby guys on that thing. And uh, to this day, we still talk about that when we get <laughs> we get together for our reunion, and it's incredible.
<laughs> Actually, we might need to relive that when we go back for the reunion. Yeah. Um, so talking about uh, some of the, the, the friends that you've made at Muir College, are you still in contact with some of them? And with reunions, how many reunions have you come back to? And what's the feeling like when you go back to a reunion? Is that Chies and that camaraderie that we speak of still there? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we came back for the, you know, the 200 plus. Uh, I was in that rugby game. Um, just seeing the guys, um, again, you, you know, you leave that you leave that situation going, ah, if I could just do this more often. You know, because mm. so many of us spread out all over the world and in South Africa, and we all get busy with our lives, right? Um, but getting up there, there's just something about being a Murai. Yeah. You know, there's this, it's in your DNA. Um, it's like a connection, right? Um, but yeah, I've been down, back for a few, um, obviously not as many as I'd like to. Mm. I, and my good friend and one of my best friends, Chris Lardahan, is on me constantly uh, to come back to these. And, and uh, I definitely need to take him up on that offer. But yeah, um, it, it's it's instant, isn't it, Nasida, when you see your mate, right? It's just different. You spent such a large chunk of your life. Um, yes. With, the, with these guys every single day, playing mm. sport together for that pride of the mirror. And then uh, one day it's just not there anymore. You actually, that, that last day you walk out of the gates, uh, you don't realize that this is the last time you'll see a lot of these guys. And it's very mm. sad. But to get together and have a reunion, uh, there's nothing better. Yes. So this one is a bit of a tricky one. I would like to know. It should be easy, but it's tricky. Um, how do you believe that your time at Muir College crafted you into the gentleman that you are right now? Um, respect, you know, all the all the basic ones that we would jump to, and it's almost seen, um, yeah, the stage. But the the respect that we were installed as far as our adults, um, the culture of Muir, um, the, the, the like I've said, I respect a hundred times. I can't say that again, right? Um, but I think. Manners. I know that we, we, we have that saying, and I think they might still manage to make me or me right. Manners make it the man. The mirror. Yeah, manners make it the man. Well, manners make it the mirror right. I think was something installed in us as a very young age, a principal or horn. But just that respect and the way you treat people is something mm. I've taken away from you and has carried me through. And um, essentially, be nice. You know, uh, it taught me that uh, respect that your fellow human being. Um, and uh, taking that into the workplace has really served me well, as well as my family life. So I know you told us a story um, that you went down the banks um, and you hit somebody at the bottom. We're not going to mention any names. <laughs> but I want to know, besides or apart from that, <clears throat> what other crazy stories can you that other murides don't know, even guys that went to class with you. What other crazy things have you done in your life? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. So just I'm breaking uh, up. You can just a little bit. That's fine. I'll tell you a funny story about my dear, two dear friends uh, in Mr. Bun Hopley's um, class, and uh, he was he was our history teacher in that day. And we had these two naughty guys in the class, and if they're watching this, they know exactly who they are. And I'll mention names because they're legends. Dylan Nightingale and uh, Nick <clears throat> Nick Wilson, and I don't know why they got this idea that uh, Nick uh, walking on Dylan's back would be good for Dylan's back. I think Dylan might have got hurt in a rugby game, and Nick was like, "Listen, yeah, dude, I'll just take my shoes off and I'll walk on you. I think this is a great way to help some of those knots out of your back." So I just want you to think about this. Mister Hopley obviously is in the class, right? Yes. We we're in the class. Nick on Dylan's back massaging him I think with while walking on him and Mr. Hopley walks in I think Mr. Hopley just looked and just left the class and it was like you know I gave up with these guys and that was in the trick uh, <laughs> and I think he used to, <laughs> sorry he used to he used to try and split those two guys off uh, you know so they didn't sit next to each other yes. there's always those two guys but Mr. Hopley had this like uh, reflecting um Sort of glass cabinet in the front of the class, so like they, so he put him a, he put Dylan in front, and I think Nick at the back or vice versa. But man, and he looked over and they laughed. He thought, "What is going on?" But they can see each other in the reflection oh. of the glass cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> so those guys kept us entertained uh, forever, mate. It was fantastic. Great, what legends those two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so moving more into your life, um, I don't know what are 
the best what are some of the best achievements that you think you've achieved throughout your life thus far wow um i think from a sporting perspective uh, playing rugby was fantastic and I, i've played all over the world to be honest with you um uh, the coaching of these Charlotte Cardinals, you know, starting a brand new youth club in America. I uh, see in America, um, and it might be happening in South Africa too, sports becoming win at all costs, right? Ooh. Which is not something we grew up with. It, it was important to win, but it was also important to play. Yes. Um, and a lot of the rugby, the rugby in town here in Charlotte with the youth was, we've got to win, we've got to win, we've got to win. And so we decided, listen, yeah, we're going to split away a lot of foreigners, the Kiwi, there's Irish. Samoan guy, a couple of South Africans said, let's go start our own club. So we started the Charlotte Cardinals and um, it's become the largest youth rugby club in America in Ooh. two years, right? Because we focus so much more on the culture of rugby. I mean, rugby is great. It's lovely to play rugby. I know you've played rugby. It's awesome on the field. But as a rugby player, you know that the good stuff's outside the field. You know, yes. Maybe not before the field with practice and fitness, but Ooh. definitely after with the culture of rugby, right? <laughs> um so we don't want to install that where we grew up and where we came from. And it's been such a massive success. And we, we also do a lot of community outreach. We have about um, 40% of our kids are on full scholarships to play. Um, and that has been absolutely the greatest achievement uh, that I've been involved with, uh, giving back to the sport that's been so good to me. Definitely. Cool. So my second last question, I want to know, I want you to impart some knowledge on our young guys who are, you know, future presidents, you know, future uh, 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 directors and future leaders just in, 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 in the world because we both know that Murais does produce um, quite good leaders. What message do you have for them um, so that they can also get encouragement to become better people and uh, a good men of Mio? Yeah, I think, I don't want to, I don't want to swear. Um, I don't know if you know it's a swear word, but we have a saying with our coaches, right? Um, we, we were we were standing around with the first year we were going to be coaches for this club, and they, they said to me, "Do you have this creed for the coaches that we have to follow?" You know, and I said, "Yeah, it's very simple." I said, "Don't be a dick, right." It was as simple as that, right? In other words, be a nice person, right? Be good, be kind, right? I think we well, we get so caught up in achieving. And, and and trying to climb the corporate ladder or be successful, that we forget that we can also be a good person when doing it, right? I think that a lot of um, sort of understanding uh, or uh, of other people's needs and know that they're going through stuff, you know, empathy towards people has sort of gone out of the window. Um, but we really need to add that to our resume, right? Like, yes, it's fantastic that you've had all these achievements and you're great, you can be a great lawyer, executive CEO, but man, let's be kind, right? I know it's preaching, but be a good person. Mm. I, I would absolutely advise, because in the workforce now, um, the way things are moving and people are working from home and everything, it's very important that we can count on teammates, yes. right? It's even more so than it used to be, right? In the back in the day, you would all be together. It is what it is. Now we have to rely on people that aren't always with us, right? So that team environment is so important that yet someone has your back or you have someone's back. So in interviews that I'm on, um, yes, I, it's, it's great what I'm seeing on your resume. It's, it's fantastic. But are you a good person and are you a good team player? Mm. Right? That is probably what I'm starting to see a shift in corporate America, especially probably in South Africa too. Like, is this a good person? Will he fit or will he or she fit in the team? Right? Mm. Um, because I need, I need that. When, when the going gets tough, you need to be able to rely on the teammate. So that, that's some advice I give to some of the younger kids. Um, looking to advance. Hmm. That's some good advice, actually. Be, being a team, being a team member or a team player in a corporate environment or in any work environment does sort of create that sense of uh, of brotherhood, that sense of camaraderie, and that sense of working towards a common goal together. So I like that one. Um, I'm not going to repeat the other one, the swear word, because. <laughs> I might get into trouble with Mr. Benning. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Mr. Zemke, it was a very uh, a nice talking to you. It was a great pleasure having you on the podcast tonight. And um, any parting words you want to leave with the boys? No, fantastic. Um, I just want to say embrace and those guys that are in school now, love being a mere, mere person, take it with you, wear it like a badge and honor because I'm 47 right now. Um, showing my age, and, I, and I, like I said, I've traveled all over the world, I live in the USA, but 
I tell you what, that is right up there as far as the, the badge that I wear being a murite. It's, it's a fantastic and like I said, embrace it. It's awesome. Cool. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I hope you're going to watch the episode because you'll see yourself on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys there was uh, mr jason uh, zemka all the way in the united states of america you know with technology the beautiful thing is that we can connect with old boys from all over the world and i'm hoping you guys are enjoying the podcast this is number three number four is coming up i will not tell you who is coming on our fourth episode but for now please do not forget to hook up with us or let me put it in the old terms you can connect with us on our social media pages we're on instagram we're on facebook as well and you can watch or you can see the updates of what the school is getting up to if there's any updates about the reunions and all the other activities that omu does you can go over to our social media pages the information is right there but for now from your host Mr. Machel, and mr jason zemka all the way from america i'm saying neck pluribus impa always remember to stay second to none cheers <laughs>